In the seeker world, no one is what they seem. We all wear masks, some metaphorical, some literal. Deputy Andy knows this better than most. Hello, welcome to Answers, a lore series about secret world legends. This is a companion piece to Questions, Episode 3, and I would recommend watching that first. This will have spoilers for this game, as well as the spin-off game, The Park. Paunch, Dolly, and Friday. It seems to always come back to the kittens with Andy. We fight monstrous versions of them in both the Sam Hain event and the vanishing of Tyler Freeborn. The former, a mad cat god on the prowl, seems to have resurrected them, while in the latter, they accompany a filth-infected Andy in a nightmare version of a possible future Kingsmith. But a reference to them also shows up in a very strange place. At Atlantic Island Amusement Park, standing in the muck of the Lover's Lake gives you a slow debuff called The Kittens That Drowned. Mousing over it gives you the description, Something pulls at the ankles in Lover's Lake. This is a direct connection to Deputy Andy. It seems odd and out of place. He doesn't really have any connection to the park. He even says it was before his time. Honestly, I'm at a loss to interpret this particular part of the mystery. However, Andy does have another, albeit indirect, connection to the park, through the case of Chad the Chipmunk. In the spin-off game The Park, Chad serves the secondary antagonist, showing up at inopportune times to cause a jump scare, and even lurking in the background at the end. He once was just a park employee in a mascot costume, until the evil of the place started to get to him. Then he lost his mind and stabbed two teenagers to death with an ice pick. From early notes in the game, we know that his name was Steve, but it isn't until the end of the game that we find out his last name as well, Gardner. First, to clear up a misconception before it spreads, during a live stream on October 20th, prompted by the corresponding questions video, Someone asked developers what relationship Chad has to Andy. The fact that one of the hosts was named Andy caused some confusion, and another host declared Chad to be Andy's father. Later conversations with the developers on Discord proved that no, this was not canon. They did not, however, speak any further on the Chad-Andy connection. Back to the game itself. In a community as small as Solomon Island, it's unlikely someone with the same surname is not related, especially when it has uncommon spelling. It's almost certain that Chad, you know, I mean Steve, was related to Andy in some way. Since the park was shut down in 1980 after Chad's rampage, he would have been of Dave Gardner's generation, Andy's father, perhaps an older cousin or uncle, two close relatives who committed heinous acts of violence establishes a family history of violent insanity, something that Andy is probably predisposed to as well. There is another gardener on the island, possibly Dave and Steve's father. We find George Gardner's headstone in the Kingsmouth Congregational Cemetery. It appears to reference Journey's End, another curious connection, as that is the spot where Andy's father took the kittens. Ultimately, I do not believe Andy was responsible for his father's death. In fact, it's distinctly possible he's still alive. Andy only says that he never came back. That doesn't mean he's dead. That could just mean he never came back. Even if he is dead, during the cutscene for the annual event, The Meowling, Andy seems very squeamish. He doesn't like blood. Unlikely traits for a murderer. Furthermore, Andy can't be over 35 years old. The game takes place in 2012, something I will establish in a later video, and the cats were drowned in 1989. Atlantic Island Park closed in 1980, so Andy must have been born after that. If Andy's father disappeared a few years later, then Andy couldn't have been more than 12 and could have been as young as 6. It is unlikely, though not impossible, that a kid in that age range could overpower someone who could so easily intimidate witnesses into silence. Likewise, there's little evidence that Andy staged Checkham's death. Checkham himself seemed intent on committing suicide. 
and Sheriff Bannerman could just as easily have known about Andy's family history and decided that if anything could make him snap, a child rapist would do it. Together, the evidence seems to imply that Andy is just as mild-mannered as he seems. As dark a shadow as I cast over him in questions, ultimately I have to reject my own hypothesis. He may have a predisposition to violent insanity, but that isn't a predestination. It is likely that to counter the bad example set by his father and uncle, Andy tried to become as straight-laced, gentle, and, yes, single-minded as possible. It is likely this very single-mindedness that protected him from the fog. We know that a strong sense of self allows you to resist the filth, and the fog would be no different. No one could have a stronger idea of themselves than someone who has faced their inner darkness and won decisively. We all may wear masks, but sometimes we become them, and that might not always be a bad thing. Oh, and as for Andy's sexuality, I think he's asexual. When he talks of high school girlfriend, it was almost hilariously chaste. He seems to have missed the cues that she wanted much, much more. Even in A Piece of the Road, we only hear Moose's side of things. It's entirely possible that Andy doesn't even realize what's going on. Yes, even when Moose invites him on a picnic and calls him Boo Bear, he's just that single-minded. It's too bad that Moose might be completely barking up the wrong tree, in an entirely different way than you might think at first. Thank you for watching this episode of Answers. If you have not watched it already, you might want to watch the corresponding episode of Questions, as well as my Let's Roleplay series, I A to B. If you like this video, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And if you did not like it, then call me the homophobic slur of your choice.